أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاهم بعد Welcome back to another lecture and episode about the stories of the prophets and we are still in our preliminary series Now last week I began the lecture by saying it will be the very last of the introductory lectures Let me inshallah again claim the same thing this uh, today and let's see what happens inshallah ta'ala Last week I was proven wrong because uh, in my typical tangents and going over various material as you are aware uh, time went by and then the end of the episode was reached so let's see what we can do today inshallah ta'ala uh, I wanted to begin by uh, uh, summarizing uh, some of the main sources of the uh, topic of the stories of the prophets because uh, that's something that we all have to be very curious about where do we get the stories of the prophets from our own tradition, from our own, uh, if you like, history, from our own uh, intellectual discourse. It is interesting to note that there are hundreds of books written in modern times about the stories of the prophets. However, if you look at pre-modernity, if you look at from the beginning of the codification of Islamic sciences up until, let's say, the 1900s you know, of the CE, and basically 100 years ago, it's actually very interesting to note that we do not find a lot of books written specifically on the genre of the stories of the prophets. Now, some of you will immediately say, hold on a sec, I saw with my own eyes the famous Qasas al-Anbiya of Ibn Kathir. And uh, if you are a little bit also aware, you're going to say, oh, but is, didn't Imam al-Tabari also write uh, stories of the prophets? And we respond that in fact, both Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari, and in fact more than just these two, did not specifically write about the stories of the Prophets as a separate subject. On the contrary, these were historians who wrote large books about history. And in volume one, section one, they began with the stories of the Prophets. So what we find in the book stories, the stories of the Prophets by Ibn Kathir, is actually section one, volume one of a much larger project that he did about the history of Islam. And these histories run many, many, many volumes. And they talk about the early, uh, the Sira, the, uh, the Sira Khulafa Rashidun, the Abbasids, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, you know, all that happened, the invasion of the Tatars, whatever, you know, has happened up until their time frame. And to begin the narrative, they have some introductory chapters. So Ibn Kathir's entire translation that we find, or even in Arabic, is in fact introductory chapters. They're not even, it's not even a full volume, to be honest, of his, uh, of his treatise about history. And the same goes for Al-Tabari, even though Al-Tabari has not been translated into English as far as I'm aware. Uh, let me take that back. It has been translated in a academic translation, which is not available in popular print, but it is available uh, if you're willing to splurge a lot of money, or if you go to academic libraries, you will find the Tabari's uh, history entirely translated. It is very interesting to note that uh, other than these two, uh, Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari, generally speaking, and even they didn't specify, it is not common to find any author of repute, any scholar who wrote a specific book about the stories of the prophets. So then where do we get this information from? We get it from uh, the books of tafsir primarily. And we also find tidbits in the commentaries of hadith. And this is where we're going to have to mine from within our own tradition what we know about the stories of the Prophets. So every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the stories of the Prophets in the Quran, and of course the Quran is full, almost one third of the Quran as we said is stories of the Prophets. We can go back to dozens of tafsirs. There are no exaggeration over a hundred 
tafsir written uh, you know, in early Islam up until pre-modernity, actually more than 100, but any, there's maybe around 30 or 40 that are the references in mainstream you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Sunni Islam. And these 30 or 40, uh, and of course there are more than that, I'm saying these are like the main, like you talk about al-Tabad, you can talk about al-Baghawi, uh, you can talk about tafsir of al-Su'ud, you can talk about al-Kashaf, al-Zamakhshari, you can talk about Abu Hayyan, all of these famous books of tafsir al-Baghawi, tafsir also has a lot of stories, uh, commentary about the stories. Of course, Ibn Kathir, the famous historian, also wrote a tafsir of the Quran, the same Ibn Kathir who has the Qasas al-Anbiya, and he wrote a history. He also wrote a book about uh, tafsir. Interestingly enough, Al-Tabari also wrote a history and also wrote a tafsir. So if you look at these early books of tafsir, uh, for, beginning from around you know, 250, 300 Hijra, Hijra, all the way up until uh, you know, 700, 800 Hijra, uh, you find, as we said, around 30 or 40 standard books of tafsir that any you know, scholar would have in his library or at least have access to. And within these books of tafsir, you will find snippets, tidbits, you will find phrases here and there that uh, are narrated from within our tradition about the stories of the uh, prophets. Now, the question arises, where did these authors get these tidbits from? And we'll talk about that in five, 10 minutes, inshallah ta'ala. Other than this, interestingly enough, we do not find that many books. Now, there are one or two books I'm just gonna reference here just so that you should be aware of that. Uh, just like in any civilization, just like in any culture, you know, you have the scholars, you know, you have the intellectual giants, and then you have the figures that are more uh, literature based, more, you know, uh, novel writing, more mythologies, more storytellers, right? There are one or two uh, storytellers, there are one or two books written by people whom most of the, you know, average and even the students of knowledge haven't really heard of that much. And these are not scholarly references, but you should be aware of them because I'm talking about the sources of the stories of the prophets. And I just want to point out that I am not going to reference these books at all because they are uh, not reputable whatsoever. They're simply mythologies or fables, if you like, written by figures who are more interested in stories than in academics. They're more interested in fables and in uh, simply narrating anything that they might have heard and remember you know pre-modernity remember civilizations of old you know the level of knowledge and the level of intellectual discourse was very different than it is uh, now so we have a number of books that you should simply be aware of of them is uh, a book called Ara'isul Majalis uh, which is actually a book about the stories of the prophets written by a Tha'labi who died 427 Hijra and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and others he say uh, they say that a Tha'labi himself was a righteous man in his own life he was a good man but he didn't care about authenticity whatsoever. He simply absorbed everything without a filter and then put it into his book. And the even more apocryphal book, which is actually a very bizarre book written by an author that we don't know anything about. Uh, really, we don't have even, even a biography. All we have is a name uh, that uh, Muhammad al-Kisai, he wrote a book called Qasas al-Anbiya. And Qasas al-Anbiya, this person died roughly around 500 Hijra as well. Uh, by the way, this al-Kisai is not the famous al-Kisai who is the grammarian and the Qari of the Quran. This is a Kisai that lived uh, 127, like 150 Hijra era, that era, very early on. We're not talking about that guy. We're talking about another person with the same last name, but a different first name, Muhammad al-Kisai, who, uh, really was basically a storyteller. That's all that he was. He didn't have any scholarly reputation. And he compiled fables. It's literally legends. And again, all you need to do is read the first few chapters, you know, the notion of the earth being on top of a whale. This is literally what is found in the book, you know, and these exotic creatures and whatnot. It's just literally, you know, like uh, a thousand and one nights, Alf Layla Walayla, you know, or, you know, these types of, uh, you know, Aesiop's fables or something. It's something of this nature. So it's not a scholarly book, but it has been translated into English. It is available in popular print. You will find it on Amazon and others. Qasas al Anbiya or the stories of the prophets by Al Kisai. Please be aware that this book firstly it's not the famous al say a lot of people misunderstand even some students of knowledge they 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 mistakenly say this is the famous al say no the famous al say lived at a different time different era different place and he was a scholar this person is not the famous one he is really somebody we don't know anything about but he wrote a book that became popular amongst the masses you know the the basically trash journalism basically type of stuff and it is just a bunch of exotic fables, you know, not, no heads nor tails as we say in English, but it has 
gained traction in some circles and uh, it was translated into Persian as well. It was translated into Turkish. And then uh, two decades ago, I think three decades ago, it was translated into English and it was then published as the stories of the prophets in Islam and whatever. Uh, this is not a book that we reference whatsoever. It is folklore and legends. It's not even, you know, uh, uh, Israelite, which, which is we're gonna come to uh, in a few minutes. Now, uh, the point being, and this is a very interesting topic that I wish we had more time to go into. It is very interesting to note that the topic of the stories of the prophets has not been given the type of dedicated attention that we now find this topic having in our discourse and vernacular. If you walk into a bookstore in Arabic or English about the stories of the prophets, you will find, as I said, dozens of books written in the last two or three decades. But ask about books written pre-modernity specialized in stories of the prophets. Ibn Kathir does not count because he didn't, he didn't intend the book just for the stories of the prophets. He intended history and they took, as we said, section one of volume one. And so it's there, but it's not, he didn't write a book just about the stories of the prophets. And At-Tabari, you will find it as well. He didn't do that. You will be hard pressed to find a reputable scholar who wrote a book just about the stories of the prophets. Now. Why is this the case? Well, we can only surmise or guess uh, why this is the case. Is. But I think one of the reasons for this is actually very interesting. And that's why I'm pausing here and going into a little bit more uh, detail. And that is that a lot of people have a misunderstanding, a superficial understanding that knowledge is a done deal. Knowledge is a stagnant discourse that once you've done something, khalas, that is it. You can shut the book, close the chapter, you know, end the story, lift the pen. And there's nothing new to add about our knowledge. And this type of mindset is not only incorrect, it is easily disprovable, even though sometimes even ulama feel this way. It is easily disprovable. Knowledge of any field is vibrant, it is organic, it grows. Knowledge even of tafsir and hadith it's, you're not going to you know, find new hadith, but new interpretations, no problem. New ways of understanding, new linking between the chains, it can be done. No knowledge is absolutely stagnant. You can always bring something interesting and new. And so much has been left for later generations to build on earlier generations. And there are many reasons for this. Of them is that we build on what we know. So the more we discover, the more we grow, the more we have access to books that were you know, lost or, or, or forgotten. Or, or marginalized, or even the more we know about other disciplines, because now we're talking about interdisciplinary studies, right? We're bringing in aspects of philosophy and history and sociology and anthropology. We're rethinking through things, and sometimes that's dangerous. I'll be the first to say that, but sometimes it's very, very useful. And if you do it properly with the right attitude, so much can be gained. So here we have a simple example. Why do we not find our earlier ulama taking this topic of Qasas al-Anbiya and making it into a separate category. Why do we have to go through the tafsir and read many, many volumes and then we find snippets here and there? Even in the tafsir books, we do not find the story of Musa A to Z, the story of Harun A to Z. We don't find it in chronological order. We simply have a commentary of the Quranic verse, whatever Allah is talking about in that particular chapter, they, they explain it and then they move on. Why not? Well, as we said, we can only surmise. But one of the things that can be said is that Minds change, cultures change, levels of education change, perceptions of knowledge change, how you view the world changes. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. We don't have to idolize or idealize an earlier era of 100 years ago or 500 years ago. We don't have to discredit them, but we don't have to take them as our end all and be all. Minds change organically, cultures change, people's perceptions of matter and reality changes. And there's nothing wrong with this. It is what it is. And we deal with the reality as it comes. And therefore, in our era, there's a huge interest in the stories of the prophets that was not there the way that we have it. The way that we're interested in the stories of the prophets, we don't find it 100, 300, 500, 700, 1,000 years ago. The way that we want, we want to find the entire stories of Adam السلام, and of Idris السلام, and of Nuh and of Ishaq. We want it all in chronological order. We want to have a book or we want to have a series of lectures where we go over the entire stories of the prophets. 
you're going to have to go to modern references for this. You will not find them in classical sources the way that we are interested in. An analysis of what, uh, uh, of what each of the prophets did and said, the ethical and moral lessons to derive, uh, you know, try to link that to uh, archaeological uh, excavations or other aspects of history. This is something that so much can be done. And even the series of lectures that I am doing, it is really just the beginning of so much more. And that's always, there's always more to do. You can always always come to an ancient topic, an old topic, and give it a fresh look, rethink through it. And I hope inshallah ta'ala, my previous series that I've done, all of them, inshallah they've demonstrated that for you. The seerah that I've, I have done, you know, so many years ago, inshallah it is an example of that. Nothing new is brought in terms of an actual fact. I cannot invent something new, but synthesizing, trying to understand and analyze the relevancy to our world, you know, trying to rethink through things that maybe, you know, some ulama had one view, but it was a majority or minority view. So that's something that we can bring to the table. Another point that can possibly be added is that, and this is an interesting point, is that we now have a philosophy of education, call it a, uh, a pedagogy. We now have a way of wanting to teach others and we understand the importance of the narrative and stories when it comes to teaching. Of course, the Quran preceded us in this because that's why one third of the Quran is stories. But we now understand that stories serves a mechanism or a tool in how to convey information. It's one of the most powerful mechanisms to convey morality, to convey uh, ideas. And we understand this better than perhaps some of our predecessors did. And if you look at any uh, educational you know, philosophy or narrative, if you look at uh, the pedagogy of any uh, school, you will understand that of a modern you know, uh, psychologists have, have, have understood this reality. So our mindsets therefore are tuned differently. And we as a product of our modern times are also interested in studying our classical history in a different uh, manner. Perhaps one can also add that we are inter increasingly interacting with Judeo-Christian civilizations in a manner that uh, perhaps you know many other uh, earlier Muslims did not, because again realize that it is somewhat of a modern phenomenon, somewhat of modern. There are certain exceptions like Andalus or other places, but it is somewhat of a modern phenomenon where Muslims are a minority amongst much larger civilizations, and we see and know their cultures and their backgrounds so much more. So perhaps our curiosity is peaked in a different way, and we are very interested in especially the commonalities because the Judeo-Christian civilization also views these prophets with uh, respect and so we want to find what is common between us and what is different so anyway all of these are potential uh, reasons about why this topic was not given the type of emphases that we are now giving it in our era especially as we said for the last you know 50 or 40 years and especially in the last i would say two or three decades from the 1970s onwards uh the the quantity of books that has been written about qasas al anbiya you know i i was for the purposes of our talk my talks that i'm doing you know i was buying and researching and downloading and after a while you understand you have to choose there's simply too much to do and there are different types of books you have the basic books for children you know, of the best of them is by the famous Indian scholar uh, Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, Allah Yarhamu, uh, the Qasas al Anbiya, which is really one of the best books written for children, and it has been translated into English and, and other languages as well. It's written in very simple and easy Arabic, and it's a very simple introduction to this topic. And then you have specialized books. I have a number of PhDs in my uh, library that are specific for, uh, let's say, the story of one prophet in the Quran, or for example, uh, hadith about the various prophets, for example. So you have very advanced books that are very specialized in a particular field and niche. And then you also have a lot of general introductions to the stories of the prophets. And each one of them has its pros and cons, its methodologies, and so on and so forth. So the point of this first point was, what are my sources? The response is there is no one source. I was asked this question a lot when I did the seerah. And if you go back to my seerah lectures in the first two or three lectures, I went over some of the sources and I and I categorized them and I mentioned them. And then for the rest of the seerah, I referenced them. When it comes to the Qasas al-Anbiya, there is no easy list at all. And I can't give you any list. On the contrary, for every single topic, I will have to go to different uh, sources. and. Uh, there are different genres of sources. Obviously, primarily, the first genre we turn to is tafsir, as we said. And then we turn to uh, the books of history, at tabari and Ibn Kathir. And then we turn to uh, other, I mean, obviously, the, the commentaries of hadith as well. But in my particular case, as I said in my very first lecture, I will actually uh, explore, uh, inshallah, unexplored territories. I, 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 I have a different 
worldview, a different mindset, and I want to uh, go into details and, and tangents perhaps that perhaps are unprecedented, and I do understand, uh, as usual, that will get me into my typical trouble and refutations, but so, so be it, inshallah, Allah is the final judge in the hereafter, and after we leave this world, our legacies and history shall also be our judge as well, and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal for acceptance, and ask Allah Azza wa Jal for what I say to be of benefit for discerning people, even if it shakes some people's minds, or they are uh, a bit hesitant to have anything new, because again, it's a mindset, right? A lot of people simply don't want anything new, and if you bring them anything new, they think that automatically you should be discredited, who are you to bring in what not, and it's not a matter of who I am or you are, here are the facts, this is what we have to say. Here are some of the problems. How can we uh, interpret them? And there are major issues or problems. There are, you know, uh, uh, controversies that come up, right? How do we explain, for example, the commonality of, let's say, the flood myth, okay? How do we explain that this, there seems to be some type of back and forth between Babylonian civilization, between, uh, you know, ancient uh, sources here and there? We we'll have to come to these questions. And, you know, obviously our earlier scholars were, you know, they had a different um, uh, set of parameters and different knowledge that they're dealing with. They don't have to worry about uh, commonalities between this and that and differences or um, uh, archaeological evidence, for example, right? Is there any archaeological evidence uh, of uh, any of these earlier prophets? What if there seems to be a, 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 a disconnect between what history uh, tells us based on archaeology versus what uh, tradition tells us? What do we seem to do? What do we do about that? These are areas that uh, are interesting. They're unique. They're unexplored. And I will try my best to at least begin the discourse. And, you know, if I'm right, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I'm uh, uh, incorrect, it is from me and it is from uh, the whisperings of shaitan. But I hope that at least by sparking this discussion, other people uh, will raise the bar and bring forth something new. So I will uh, go beyond just the standard narratives and traditional stories that are found in Ibn Kathir and others, and I will explore uh, other aspects. And you will, inshallah, see this in the course of the, the lectures that I am uh, giving. Now, when it comes to sources, inshallah ta'ala, I will try my best to reference everything that I say in a manner that is sufficient for uh, the advanced students without uh, harming the narrative style. Because again, the point is that this is not an academic book, this is a series of lectures. So I need to balance between those that are just interested in, in you know, the end result versus those that might want to go uh, deeper. So what I'm going to try to do is, if it's something in the Quran or Sunnah, I'll quickly reference it. If it's something that is in another source, I'll also try my best to just point out, well, we learned from this source, or even Kathir says, or something of this nature, so that you will understand where uh, I am, I'm getting this information from. And obviously, I'll bring in historians of other civilizations as well, Western, modern historians who talk about the archaeological ruins, let's say. So for example, there's an article article recently about uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the potential uh, realities of these cities uh, having been discovered, uh, you know, uh, in uh, the land uh, that uh, uh, is, is around those lakes, uh, uh, the, the, the Dead Sea. And so that's something that's interesting. So do we have archaeological remains? Uh, the, the issue comes about the Qawm Aad and the Thamud. We have remains that are uh, alleged to be the people of Thamud, okay? Uh, there are certain questions that, that arise because historically what we learn to be those archaeological remains, they do not date back to when Thamud would have actually lived. They date back to uh, 100, 200 years before the coming of the Prophet Wasallam, And that doesn't quite match up. So again, these are questions that arise. We're talking about uh, the, the civilizations in Madain Salih, right? That if you date them archaeologically, uh, they go back to around 400 or 300 C, many of those remnants there, uh, 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 which is basically 200 years or 150 years before the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu But that does raise a problem because between Isa and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi there was no Prophet, there was no Rasul, there was no Nabi that came. And yet, you know, people think that is the time of Thamud. So these are questions. And again, by the way, I'm not answering it today. I'm just simply saying uh, with my utmost respect to our scholarly tradition, as far as I'm aware, these are questions that are simply not discussed in our earlier books. And that's because they have a different mindset and they're, they, they have their own ways of looking at things and they have uh, certain facts that you know they're content with. And we have another set of facts that we have to deal with. What do you do when carbon-14 dating and when histories of other civilizations, we have, and again, I'm going to a tangent here, we have historians of, of Rome and of other places mentioning these civilizations uh, the the the, uh, the remnants of the Nabataeans and their descendants, which is Madain Saleh, right? And so everything matches 
from one angle, but it doesn't match from another, another. and that is that, as I said, uh, if these are the remnants of Thamud, for example, uh, how do we understand and explain this? So again, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. When we get to Thamud alayhi salam, uh, uh, sorry, Salih alayhi salam, slip of the tongue, Salih alayhi salam, the people of Thamud, when we get to Salih alayhi salam, we will discuss these issues. My, my point being, I'm interested in that. That's the way my mind works. I want to go down these areas and tangents. There's no question that in exploring these difficult questions, I'm going to be bringing things that are new and it's going to raise some eyebrows and questions. A lot of people reject, a lot of people problematize. So be it, uh, present a better position. That's my, my, my challenge. If you disagree with something, uh, no problem. I am simply presenting my own uh, evidences and research and I expect you to then raise the bar, answer the questions that I bring, and then maybe present a better alternative. And in the end of the day, it's simply an opinion and there's no need to you know, <laughs> do all of the types of uh, refutations or whatnot. That's really not something that I'm interested in. In any case, so this is our first point, by the way. We have two points today, inshallah, and then we are done, inshallah, for the introduction. So the first point was the sources and I explained that we do not have a standard list, unlike Sira, where we have a standard list of sources, Ibn Hisham, and Ibn Ishaq, you know, Al-Waqidi, we have a standard list of sources. These are the primary sources that of the Sira. We do not have an equivalent in Qasas Al-Anbiya. Rather, what we have is tidbits scattered across many genres and disciplines, and we now have modern books that are basing uh, much of their uh, writings on these genres and disciplines and then we move to the second point and they're also basing it on a very very interesting source and this is going to be our second point and our final point for today and that is one of the main sources of the stories of the prophets even found in the books of tafsir because again al-baghawi for example al-tabari he died 311 hijrah and al-tabari is talking to us about idris alayhi salam and Idris probably lived before the time of Nuh. How does the Tabari know the details of Idris alayhi salam? Where is he getting it from? If you read Ibn Kathir and it's like, you know, 200 pages of English, 300 pages of English, you find fact after fact and point after point. But where is he getting it from? How does Ibn Kathir, who died 774, how does Ibn Kathir, you know, rahimahullah ta'ala, know the details of Ishaq alayhi salam and his household? and the children of Ishaq. Where did he get this from? And Ismail and what happened there? And you know, uh, uh, Yunus and whatnot. Where is he getting it from? Here we get to one of the most controversial aspects when it comes to Qasas wal Anbiya, and that is the issue of what is called in Arabic, the Israeliyat, the Israeliyat. Now, what is the Israeliyat? The Israeliyat are uh, the, the, the sources, the references that are used by the Judeo-Christian civilizations and have been adopted by Muslim ulama. This is what Israeliyat are. The Israeliyat are facts and narrations whose origins are not the Quran and Sunnah. Because if it's the Quran, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's the authentic Sunnah, it is from the Prophet ﷺ, which is from Allah Azza wa Jal, because he never says anything of his own mind. So the Quran and Sunnah give us a very, very, very skeletal information about the Prophets. The Quran and Sunnah does not come with a single date. Not a single date is referenced. And why would it? Because the Hijri calendar was invented after. What date would the Quran use? What date would the Sunnah use? There is no date. The Quran and Sunnah does not come with a chronology whatsoever. It does not mention a detail, I should say, obviously, very briefly, Allah says that, you know, sometimes after them came and before them, very, 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 very briefly, very generically. But a detailed chronology of who came first and who came second and who came third, the Quran and Sunnah does not mention that whatsoever. How do we know that Idris came before Nuh uh, and after Adam? How do we know this information? Well, this is where we come to Israeliyat. And it is something that we need to discuss, and that's what we're doing right now. So the uh, Israeliyat are the Judeo-Christian sources that our earlier scholars took from. And the fact of the matter, the undeniable reality, is that the bulk of the information about the prophets that we have even in our tafsir books, including Al-Tabari and Al-Baghawi and so many books, and the bulk of Ibn Kathir's Qasas al-Anbiya is not coming from the Quran and Sunnah. 
It is coming from Israeliyat. It is coming from Israeliyat. And the topic of Israeliyat deserves a much longer topic. It is something that concerns the scholars of Tafsir and it concerns the scholars of the Qasas al Anbiya genre. But we can begin by pointing out that our Prophet وسلم, clearly has a number of ahadith about this topic of getting information from the uh, uh, Judeo-Christian sources. And the most famous of them, uh, reported uh, in, in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, that uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the people of the book would recite the Torah in Hebrew. And then they would explain it in Arabic to the Muslims. This is in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they would uh, recite the Torah in Hebrew. By the way, the Old and New Testament were not translated into Arabic uh, for the first century or so of Islam. The earliest Arabic translations occurred way after in the time of the Umayyads. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived, when the Sahaba lived, the Old and New Testament did not exist in Arabic as a book. Rather, they were written in Hebrew, and we have authentic reports. The Prophet saw it in Hebrew, uh, and uh, you know they, they showed him the verse of the Rajam or the stoning in Hebrew. It did not exist in Arabic. However, the Jewish people would recite it in Hebrew, uh, or the Christians would recite it in Syriac. That was the language that they used, or Aramaic as well. But Syriac was the common Christian language, and Hebrew was the common Jewish language of the scriptures. And then they would explain it in Arabic to the to the Muslim community. So. Our Prophet Sallallahu said to the Muslim community interacting with the Jewish community of Medina لا تصدق أهل الكتاب ولا تكذبوهم Do not believe what the people of the book say to you and do not negate it. Do not believe and do not negate. But rather say آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ We believe in Allah and we believe in what has been revealed to us and we believe in what has been revealed to you. And uh, our Prophet also said, do not write anything from me other than the Qur'an. Whoever writes anything other than the Qur'an, let him wipe it away. This is an early Islam. He forbade even writing hadith later in later Islam in the later times of prophecy. He allowed writing of hadith, but early he did not allow it. And then he said, And narrate from the children of Israel and do not find that to be problematic. In other words, he is saying, go ahead and narrate their stories. Go ahead and learn from them. Go ahead and take from them and don't worry. Now, this seems to give an open license. There's another narration which problematizes this. And that is that once our Prophet وسلم, came across Umar bin Khattab, who was trying to read uh, uh, you know, something from the Jewish scripture, uh, you, know, in his, uh, you know, this is an interesting question, is that how did he access this? Was he going through uh, another Jewish person? Was he was he trying to learn Hebrew on his own? Uh, we don't have those details. But he was trying to learn something of the Jewish uh, theology and Jewish law. And our Prophet وسلم, said that, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, if Moses were alive right now, he would have no option but to follow me. Now, this seems to indicate that the Prophet وسلم, is forbidding Umar al Khattab from learning Jewish sources and Jewish literature and Jewish theology. He's saying, why are you doing that? Even if Moses were alive, he'd have to follow me right now because I have superseded you know, the previous law. How do we reconcile between, um, all of this? So uh, our scholars have said, Imam Malik was asked about this, and he said that uh, we are allowed to narrate from them those stories that are hasan, that are good. As for that which we know to be a lie, then we should shut and close their scriptures. So Imam Malik said, if the story seems to be good and it's generically okay, it's fine, then go ahead and narrate. However, if the story contains falsehood, if it uses the prophets of shirk, of murder, of incest, as I explained to you two lessons ago, of, of, of rape and pillaging, which some of the you know, Old Testament prophets are accused of you know, murdering a person to get to his wife, whatever, if it's that type of stuff, then we do not narrate it except to warn against it. We do not narrate it except to warn against it. And Ibn Taymiyyah uh, says that there's three categories of uh, Ahl Kitab literature. The first is that it affirms what is in our sources, so we go ahead and narrate it. So the stories of Adam uh, and, and Hawa, they're the same, they're, the, 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 the skeletal you know, realities are the same. The temptation of Iblis, of Satan, the skeletal realities are the same. So we can quote their sources. 
The second is that which explicitly contradicts. So, for example, uh, uh, the, the the claim that you know the prophets committed murder or they committed you know uh, incest or whatnot. This goes against our theology. So we are not allowed to narrate it except to warn against it. And then Ibn Taymiyyah says the third category is that which gives us details that are not found in our scripture, nor do they contradict our scripture. And he said in this category that it is permissible to narrate, but we should be cautious and wary. We should understand that this knowledge could be wrong and could be corrupted, but there's no sin per se in putting them uh, 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 in, into our books and our writings. And it is this essential paradigm that uh, the bulk of earlier scholars follow. And you will not find any book of Tafsir written uh, in the first five, six hundred years in which its authors completely refuse to take any Israeliyat. Some authors are far more prone to Israeliyat than others, no question about that, right? You know, Al-Baghli, for example, even al Pabli has a lot of Israeliyat uh, in his, uh, in his um, uh, Tafsir. And by the way, uh, what makes it even more complicated is, you know, where do these Israeliyat come from? Did a Tabari himself read the Jewish scriptures? Well, maybe he did, but in reality, he didn't need to, because much of the Israeliyat actually comes from our own scholars of the earlier generations, some of them even Sahaba. And this raises very, very interesting questions that we don't have the time to get into. Maybe uh, uh, I do have more advanced classes. I teach, uh, and I teach classes at the, uh, uh, at the seminary that, that, I, that I'm involved with. And, in those classes, we do a lot more. This is still a very basic, you never know, really level of thing. Uh, but uh, to, to, to be very simplistic here, um, al Tabari does not have to quote the Jewish sources directly. al Tabari can quote great ulama and sahaba, people like Ibn Abbas, ta'ala, and Abu Huraira even, and Ibn Umar and others, because these sahaba would narrate from Israeliyat and they didn't have a problem doing so. Now, where did they get it from? They got it from a group of early converts from Judaism. A number of early Sahaba were scholars of the Jewish faith. A number of early Tabirun were scholars of the Jewish faith. For example, Abdullah ibn Salam was the chief rabbi of Medina and he converted to Islam. For example, Ka'b al Ahbab. One of the most learned people of this generation. He was a learned rabbi from Yemen and he converted to Islam perhaps even in the lifetime of the Prophet, so somebody never met him. He migrated to Medina at the time of Umar al Khabab and he became a very prominent theologian, a very prominent, uh, not theologian, a very prominent scholar, uh, a person of letters. Uh, and he taught Ibn Abbas. He was one of the teachers of Ibn Abbas in the genre of Israeliyat. And Ka'b al Ahbar accompanied Umar al Khattab to Jerusalem. Right? It was very interesting. So, Ka'b, a Jewish uh, uh, rabbi from Yemen, embraces Islam. And then he enters Jerusalem along with the conquering army. And he directed and he helped Umar al Khattab to know the site. And he was the one who suggested to build the masjid on the Dome of the Rock. And uh, Umar al Khattab said, No, your Jewishness is still in you. You know, you, we should build it away from the dome, put the dome behind us, and Abdullah in front of us. So the Masjid al Qibali or the Masjid al Rumali was then placed there. And then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan built the Masjid on the dome, uh, basically going back to the suggestion of Ka'b al Ahbar. So Ka'b al Ahbar was a rabbi, and he is mentioned in Hadith literature uh, very frequently. He was very popular, very respected. Uh, uh, intellectual man who interacted with some of the senior Sahaba and taught some of the junior Sahaba. And so a lot of these informations came from somebody like him. You also had Wahab ibn Hudabbin, another Jewish convert and a student of Abu Hurairah, uh, a generation after Gap. And Wahab also has a lot of narrations that he, again, now the question arises, is this bad? Is this evil? No. Here's the point, which is again a very deep point. The, the Sahaba and the Tabi'un, generally speaking, did not have a problem accepting knowledge of the previous prophets and knowledge of their folklore because they're not learning fiqh from Ka'b al-Ahbar. They're not learning yani, advanced theology from what they would have been. They're learning about Sulaiman and Dawood. They're learning about you know, the, the, the early prophets. And the presumption was, and this is very clear by the way, the presumption was that, hey, what's wrong? They know their stuff and they're people of knowledge and people of faith. 
and you know they, they have knowledge we don't have, we might as well benefit from them. So Ibn Abbas it is well known that he absorbed uh, and in fact uh, some of the Sahaba even had access to uh, some of their works. They might even have uh, some of the junior Sahaba and definitely some of the Tafirun uh, read cursory Hebrew. And they would absorb this information directly from the books. Kaab al had his library when he embraced Islam. And his library was absorbed by the Muslim community. And it's very interesting here that uh, they, uh, they, they absorbed this information and they narrated it without problematizing it. Now, very interestingly, uh, Ibn Khaldun, and by the way, again, all of this is a very interesting topic. Ibn Khaldun is an Andalusian scholar. Um, far ahead of his time, somebody that I resonate with, resonate with immensely, very perceptive, he's considered to be the father of sociology, uh, he's a mind that is very different from most of the other uh, clergy of his era and before his era, and uh, if you read him, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, Ibn Khaldun, uh, in his famous Muqaddimah, uh, he talks about this phenomenon of the Sahaba and Tabirun absorbing Israeliyat so easily, and he says, and this is a summary, that the early Arabs were a people who did not have civilization or knowledge of history. And the Ahli Kitab, and especially the Jews, were considered to be people of knowledge and history. So there was this, he didn't, he does not use the term, there was this notion that, uh, you know, we might call it a type of, and please don't misunderstand me, a type of, I don't want to use the term here, but this notion that this civilization is more knowledgeable than us. Okay? So there's this default that they simply are acquiescing subconsciously that this civilization is a lettered civilization, we are an unlettered civilization. This civilization has a long series of you know literature and prophets and libraries. We are just coming, we're just beginning. So there's this automatic notion that this civilization, the Yehudi and whatnot, is uh, uh, in some ways more advanced than ours. So Ibn Khaldun mentions, so they naturally took from them without critically thinking. And that uh, he and that these these early you know authorities assume that the knowledge was beyond question. There's no need to question. And uh, Ibn Khaldun remarks uh, that uh, very perceptive remark here. He says that the the early uh, converts were actually bringing knowledge that is not found in the modern Jewish sources because the Jewish converts were influenced by a strand of Judaism uh, that is Himyari, that is Yemeni. And by the way, this is a really interesting point here. So pause here, footnote. Much of the Israeliyat that we find, uh, much of the Israel that we find in our sources, we do not find in modern uh, Jewish sources. You have the Tanakh, you have the uh, the commentaries of the of the Old Testament, you have the Mishnah, which is the Oral Torah, you have the Talmud, which is a collection of fatawa and commentaries of a select period of rabbis, you have the Kabbalah, you have the Zohar, which is more mystical, you have a whole set of Jewish literature. Now it is published, now it is all available, you have this all. Now if you look at the, uh, the Israeliyat that is found in our tradition, some of it is found in the Kabbalah, some of it is found in the Tanakh, some of it is found uh, in the Mishnah uh, and in, and in, in the, 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 the sources, but some of it is not. And the origin of that is basically strands of Judaism that modern Judaism does not have access to. So we actually have Israeliyat in our tradition that is not recorded by the Western branch that is now you know, uh, printing books and whatnot. And that's a very interesting and advanced um, uh, topic that is beyond the scope of even my area of expertise. My point being Ibn Khaldun mentions the psychological framework of why some of the earlier ulama did not have a problem in accepting uh, uh, Israeliyat, and uh, later on, other ulama began to then become far more critical. This level of critical thinking, this level of rejecting Israeliyat, is not found in early Islam. One of the one of the uh, earliest critics of Israeliyat is actually Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah comes along, and he finds the whole genre extremely problematic. He's not the first, but he's one of the first to really. I would say, want to push the door shut to Israeliyat. He's not happy with Israeliyat, and he wants to try to minimize. And his student Ibn Kathir, who wrote the tafsir, his student Ibn Kathir actually attempted to do this project in his tafsir by trying to minimize the concept of uh, Israeliyat as much as uh, possible. And after Ibn Taymiyyah, 
we did have a number of authorities who basically wanted to get rid of Israeliyat. In modern times, there is a strand of ulama, of thinkers, of academics, who refuse to quote any Israeli, uh, Israeliyat um, uh, uh, narration, anything found in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. They simply want to neglect and ignore it, and they want to restrict themselves to the Quran and Sunnah only. Now, you will say, isn't that a good idea? Why should we have to do that? And the response is, if you were to do this, then the entire book of Qasas al-Anbiya would be a pamphlet and not a book. And our entire series of Qasas al-Anbiya would simply go down to maybe four or five or 10 lectures. Well, being a bit, uh, you know, uh, exaggerating, maybe 15, 20 or something. And the bulk of what you have learned and heard about the Qasas al-Anbiya would be thrown out the window. You cannot write a extensive commentary of the Qasas al-Anbiya without resorting to Israeliyat. Ibn Kathir, the bulk of it is Israeliyat. Really it is. And to give you one simple example, the very chronology of the prophets, the very chart of the prophets that everybody talks about and it is found in every second Muslim household, right? Of the genealogical chart, you know, forget the fact that you know, it is not authentic. Anyway, where does it come from? It comes from Israeliyat, 100% Israeliyat. It is found in the Old Testament. The genealogy of Ibrahim, the genealogy of Nuh and his ancestors to Adam, it is coming straight from Israeliyat. There's not a single hadith, much less verse of the Quran, that talks about these types of notions and things. So when you understand that getting rid of Israeliyat basically means we have nothing, very little, not nothing, but very little left. And when you understand that the Sahaba did not seem to have that type of harshness that later some of the later ulama did. I think that we can find a reasonable middle ground, and that is that we really should not problematize Israeliyat as long as they do not explicitly contradict our theology, and we point out that this is coming from the Judeo-Christian sources. And we say Judeo-Christian, in reality, is, it is more Jewish than Christian, because again, Christian sources, they only talk about Jesus. They do not talk about the prophets before Jesus. And so only when it comes to Jesus Christ himself are we dealing with Christian sources about the birth and the times of Jesus. Otherwise, every other prophet, we're talking about the Jewish uh, literature, uh, which is basically, as we said, the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, and the Mishnah, which is the oral commentaries that are then recorded, and the Talmud, which is um, uh, the collection of basically rabbinical folklore, the, not, not folklore, rabbinical uh, commentaries and rabbinical verdicts is more the, pro the it's like a collection of fatawa. And it's, all of these are, are available if you read Hebrew. Some of them have been translated into, into English, but the majority are still only in, in, in Hebrew. And of course, you have other um, uh, books as well that would have these stories, uh, you know, that we can uh, compare and contrast them to. The point being that in these series of lectures, I will take recourse to the Israeliyat because it is necessary to do so. And anybody who has ever written about Qasas al-Anbiya in a lengthy book, will you will find details that are only found in the Israeliyat. Otherwise, uh, the Quran and Sunnah is very skeletal. And again, remember, the purpose of the Quranic stories is the morality of the stories. And in, in order to, do, to emphasize the morality, much of the history is simply skimmed over. And the best example for this is the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. The entire story has only the names of Yusuf and uh, uh, Yaqub. We don't even know the names of his brothers. We don't know the name of the minister. We don't know the name of the king. We don't know anything else. Not a single date is mentioned, right? And this is actually the strength of the Quran. Anybody who has read the Old Testament, you understand how difficult it becomes to read because the human mind shuts down with all the details that come. We don't like all of those details. So and so begat so and so, so and begat so and so. All of that detail shuts it down. The Quran doesn't care about that. The Quran wants you to know the moralities of the stories, the purpose of the stories. And this is the strength and the beauty of the Quran. But when you have an entire lecture about Yusuf alayhi salam, you have to begin, where did he live? Who, you know, what was, who was his mother, this and that. And in order to get that information, the Quran does not tell us that you know, uh, his brothers were half brothers, that, you know, the, the 10 were basically, uh, uh, you know, and this, for example, a simple fact like this, right? The Quran and Sunnah does not tell us that 10 of the brothers were from one sister and Yusuf and Bin Yamin, and even the name Bin Yamin, it is not in the Hadith, it is from Israeliyat, right? So those that are hardcore fanatical say, we're not going to take any Israeliyat, try it, try it. 
Go and look at this genre and see what you will come out with. It's not been done and it's not possible to be done. And if you were to do it, it would be a very little benefit. The bulk of Israeliyat really is neutral information. As we just said, there were two sisters. Yaqub married one of them. She passed away. And uh, uh, you know this is uh, Yusuf and bin Yamin. And the other sister gave the other 10 brothers. And that's one of the causes of the tension. All of this is coming from the Israeliyat. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, when the Israeliyat comes and gives us bizarre details, for example, in the story of Yusuf, the, the, uh, Allah says in the Quran that uh, that she desired him, he desired her. Were it not for the fact that he saw a burhan or an evidence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Israeliyat, some of the early scholars said, our own scholars, again, these are coming from our scholars from the Israeliyat. Qatad and others, this come from our ulama of the tabi'un, of the sahaba, uh, some of them times from the sahaba, and some of them from the tabi'un, tabi tabi'un. Our scholars quoted from the Israeliyat, and you find this in a tabari and, and, and it says that uh, the wife of the, the minister, her idol was in the room. And right when they're about to have intercourse, uh, she covered up the idol. And Yusuf said, why are you covering the idol? And she says, I don't want my idol to see this. And so Yusuf felt ashamed that if she's covering from her idol, then it is more befitting that I cover from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he stopped doing the deed. Now this story really does not make any sense. And it's coming from Israeliyat. How could Yusuf get that close and then see the idol and then be reminded of Allah? That's not appropriate at all. It goes against our theology. So we have to get rid of that story and say, only reason we should quote it is to say it's wrong that that story is wrong, it's coming from the uh, Israeliyat. It's not something that is authentic. The Burhan that he saw, it was uh, and he's either, uh, some say he saw Yaqub in a vision, uh, and some say that uh, you know, the, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal basically allowed him, or that, that strength of Iman came. The point being, there are other interpretations also found, we will stick with uh, them. So uh, to, to summarize this uh, section, and then inshallah to conclude, that one of the sources of contention when it comes to the topic of Qasas al-Anbiya is the concept of Israeliyat or the Judeo-Christian uh, narratives that are found. And by, by this, we do not just mean the actual printed books that are found in our times. Rather, when we're talking about Israeliyat, we are primarily referencing, uh, primarily referencing what our own earlier scholars, including some Sahaba and especially the Tabi'un, quoted to us as an ummah and has been preserved in our own books. But the source was not the Prophet ﷺ, the source was their Israeliyat, much of which is not actually recorded in the modern books that we find in the Jewish tradition. Because again, the Jewish tradition was a living tradition. It had it various strands and Muslims primarily interacted with the strand that was in Yemen. And the strands that are currently in vogue go back to the Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. The Yemeni strand, the Himyadi strand, it is a minority, it's still around by the way, there's still obviously some Yemeni Jews, the Sephardics or whatnot, they're still there, very small group of, of, of Jewish people. Uh, their ancestors, uh, they're, they're no longer in Yemen, they have moved to Israel and now their, their culture is now being completely gone and forgotten. Uh, anyway, that's a whole different tangent, we don't need to go down there. But uh, what I was saying is that the Israeliyat that we have typically are connected to the Himyari Yemeni Jewish strand, which is not, which has not been recorded to the level of the Babylonian strand or the uh, Jerusalem strand, which is the common strands that are now, you know, most of the Jewish people of our times, their codifications go back to those strands of Islam. Now, I don't have a problem, as I said, looking up the Israeliyat, even some modern ones. And I will go back to the Mishnah, and I will go back to the Talmud, and I will tell you if I do so. No problem with there, because the way that I see this, with my utmost respect to those that are critical of this, is that it is very clear that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed quoting without believing. Okay, حَدِّثُ عَنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ وَلَا حَرَجْ وَلَا حَرَجْ means don't feel guilty about it. وَلَا حَرَجْ means there's no problem. He says, go ahead and narrate from the children of Israel, no problem in doing so. And we should have the same attitude. As long as, as Imam Malik said, as long as what we say doesn't contradict something that is clear cut, we have the authority to narrate, but we should not definitively believe 
as the Prophet said, لا تصدقوا ولا تكذبوا Don't believe, but then don't deny it as well. So, we can believe that Ya'qub had two wives, they were two sisters. Um, Sorry, we're not, we can narrate, not to believe, I mean to say, we can narrate that Ya'qub had two wives, there were two sisters, but we don't have to take it as aqidah. If somebody were to say that's not true, we say, okay, maybe it's not true. It's not aqidah. Somebody doesn't become a kafir if he says Ya'qub did not have two wives, rather he had three wives, and uh, some of the children are from there, some of them are from there, and some of them are from there. So what? It doesn't change our aqidah. So I will be narrating from the Israeliyat, and I will mention to you when I do so, and I will not just go to the Israeliyat in our tradition. As I said, I will look up the modern Israeliyat, and I will look up modern information as well, which is beyond the Israeliyat. Now we're talking about actual facts here, archeological and historical uh, facts that we know. Uh, we know quite a lot now that some of our early scholars did not know, and we should benefit and integrate between what we know. We know a lot about uh, Babylon. We know a lot about ancient civilizations of Ur, we know a lot about uh, the Nabataeans. Why should we not take the knowledge that we have that is somewhat definitive, and if it's not, then we'll say this is presumptuous, this is something that is there, it's not definitive, and see what we can benefit from when we look at our uh, historical and theological tradition. And so with this, inshallah ta'ala, we actually do come to the conclusion of our introductory series of lectures about uh, about uh, the, the stories of the prophets. And now, inshallah ta'ala, from next week, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will begin the first of the prophets, and that is our father, Adam alayhi salam. And so with that, I conclude, and I see you, inshallah ta'ala, next week. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya man ajabta dua nuh fantasar wa hamaltahu fi fulkika almashhoon Ya man ahala an-nar hawl khalilihi rawhan wa rayhanan bi tawlika kun